Everything around me seems uncertain My weary heart can't take much more surprise I wish there was a point on the horizon Something I could see with my own eyes I need to tell you that I'm scared I feel completely unprepared Nothing's what it was two weeks ago But you already know You already know Everything I'm scared of Everything I hope You hold my tomorrow And all tomorrow holds You already know I can't seem to find the easy answers Someday I hope the suffering makes sense I just need to know that you are with me Even if you keep me in suspense We talk so much these days because I have so much to say You stay and listen to me closely even though You already know You already know Everything I'm scared of Everything I hope You hold my tomorrow And all tomorrow holds You already know Whatever I'm feeling Whatever is coming, whatever the ending, you're already there. You go before me, you go behind me. Wherever I'm going, you're already there. But you already know. You already Everything I'm scared of, everything I hope, you hold my tomorrow, and all tomorrow holds, you already know. You already know. Good morning and welcome back to our continuing study in the book of Joel. You know, sometimes God might use the tough times to correct our ways and to refine and purify us. Other times, he might use the tough times as a way to lead us to a deeper relationship with him or to equip us better to serve others. In the moment of the agony, we probably don't know the reason for the distress. In any case, our proper response to the hardship shouldn't be, God, how do I get out of this? But rather, God, what do you want me to get out of this? You know, today there's a lot of non-biblical thinking that being a Christian should exempt us from hardships and give us a trouble-free life. The prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New Testament knew better. Israel fell into a similar trap. Since they were God's chosen people, too often they concluded that they were not subject to disaster or the judgment of God. When their lives got too far out of congruence with their profession of faith in Yahweh, he sent prophets such as Hosea, Amos, Isaiah, and Jeremiah to warn them. When the prophets' words didn't get the people's attention, God allowed disaster to come upon them. This is what Joel saw happening in the plague of locusts. God might choose to turn the disaster or let his people go through it. Either way, their only hope is in him. When the Assyrians besieged Jerusalem during the time of Isaiah, God answered the prayers of King Hezekiah for deliverance and the city was spared. 
Several generations later, the Lord told Jeremiah that the city was doomed. The Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and took the people into exile. Jeremiah wrote to the first group of exiles to encourage them to continue to trust in God, that God still had plans for their good. Take a read in Jeremiah 29. Their deliverance was not from the disaster of exile, but through it to receive a future and a hope from God. We might think that the disaster of judgment was reserved for the Old Testament, but if you were to think that, you'd miss a significant part of the New Testament teaching, not only for unbelievers, but also for the church. Whatever we believe about election and eternal security, it is clear that the judgment of God does come on the church for ungodliness. The letters to the seven churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 are in part threats of disaster against the churches for disobedience to God. There are times when we have to look no further than our individual or corporate disobedience. Selfishness or greed for the explanation of our distress. But we cannot simply assume that sin is the cause of all imminent or actual disaster, especially on an individual level. In fact, Jesus rebuked his disciples for this kind of assumption when they asked him about the blind man. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? John 9.2 this kind of logic was also the fault of Job's friends, right? In harmony with the prevailing wisdom of their day, they thought that sin caused suffering, and therefore if someone was suffering, he or she must have sinned. Well, God rebukes them at the end of the story for their folly, right? Job 42. Not that Job was without fault, but their simplistic formula didn't fit his situation, and it continues to do harm in a community of faith to this day when applied rigidly. Job starts out humbly, accepting the disaster from the Lord. However, with the repeated blows from his friends, Job speaks long about the injustice of life and demands an opportunity to vindicate himself before God. When given the audience with God that he desired, Job doesn't find an explanation for his suffering or for injustice in the world, but he has a fresh encounter with the living and powerful creator of all, an encounter that, that leaves him humble and repentant. Job's chapter 40 and 42. Through the disaster, Job came to a deeper relationship with God. He says this, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you, Job 42, 5. Just as there is a special quality of human friendship among those who have suffered together, often our relationship with God grows in certain ways only by going through tough times with him. And as our relationship with God grows through suffering, so our ability to serve others grows during those times. Simply put, if we never suffer, it's difficult, if not impossible, for us to empathize or to speak with authenticity to those who do. The Lord Jesus is our prime example here. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4.15. And then the Apostle Paul tells us in, in Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Well, open your Bibles, please, to Joel 
chapter two, and we'll continue our study in this book of prophecy. Joel chapter two, verse one. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come, great and strong, the like of whom has never been seen, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations." A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like swift steeds, so they run. With a noise like chariots over mountaintops they leap, like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble like a strong people set in battle array. Before them, the people writhe in pain. All faces are drained of color. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation, and they do not break ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run to and fro in the city, they run on the wall, they climb into the houses, they enter at the windows like a thief. The earthquakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness. The Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For strong is the one who executes his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we uh, uh, we come uh, to continue our study in, in this book of Joel. Father, please open our hearts and open our minds, Lord, to the to the lessons that are contained uh, in, in, these, uh, in these words that have been put together by the prophet of long ago. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for this technology that allows us to, to continue our studies such as we are. We thank you, we love you, and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So here we are in chapter two, and, and Joel is describing what this mighty army looks like, right? And he gets, you know, some of us a bit poetic, but you know, the, the way he speaks, right? It's, it says, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming for it is at hand. You know, back in, in, in chapter one, Joel spoke of the judgment that had arrived in Judah. Remember that plague of locusts and drought and so forth. Here in chapter two, he begins really by describing a judgment that will come, a mighty army set against Judah. Since this is all part of God's day, not man's day, it's described as the day of the Lord. You know, it's true that when, when we are right with God, we want the day of the Lord. We long for him to show his strength because we know that we abide in him and he abides in us. But when we're not right with God, we dread the day of the Lord because when God shows himself strong, his strength may work against us. In Joel's day, Judah was not right with God. So the day of the Lord would be nothing but darkness and gloominess to them. You know, it goes on to say, a people come great and strong. Well, you know, it, it's hard to know what invasion Joel predicted here. And probably Joel weren't Joel was warning of an invasion that never happened because Judah responded to the invitation to repent, and God held back this army. The 40-year godly reign of King Joash in Judah began soon after the time of, of Joel's prophecy. Now, there are some commentators who believe that, that Joel refers back to the army of locusts and, and is describing them poetically. Well, it's possible. 
but it seems best on, on balance to say that he, he wrote of a literal human army ready to come against an unrepentant Judah. Like an army of locusts, if they came, they would be massive, destructive, and unstoppable. He says, a fire devours them, and behind them a flame burns. Well, you know, the urgent nature of this prophecy probably prompted Jehida to depose the wicked queen Athaliah and set Joash on the throne, even though he was only seven years old. You can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 11. Perhaps Jehida would have waited until Joash was older, but Joel's prophecy here showed him that it, it had to be done immediately. And Joel goes on to describe what this mighty army will do. Before them, the people writhe in pain. All faces are drained of color. They run like mighty men, uh, and so on. He gets pretty graphic over how this invasion will take place. You know, they do not break ranks. Everyone marches in his own column with, with a you know, chilling, you know, poetic flair. Joel describes the discipline and effectiveness of this army. Because they keep ranks and they work with energy, they bring a devastating attack on Judah. Now, if we want to consider the people of God to be like an army, perhaps based on the, these military images Paul sprinkled through his letters, then this passage shows us two things that can make God's people more effective. First, they must keep order with every soldier keeping ranks, right? And, and second, you got to work hard. And, you know, Joel describes it as soldiers serving, you know, with energy. But he puts this capper and he says, the Lord gives voice before his army. So as impressive as this invading army is, Joel doesn't want Judah to forget that their real power lies in that God has sent them. They will be his tool of judgment against Judah unless they repent. When the plague of locusts and the drought devastated Judah, you might have thought that Joel would encourage the people. He might have said, hang in there. Things are bad, but they'll get better. Tough times don't last, but tough people do. Instead, Joel said, you think that was bad? Worse is to come if we don't repent. Let's look carefully here at verse 12, right? Uh, and this is where the, you know, the, the prophet is really calling God's people to repent. Verse 12, now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast call, a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babies, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach, that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Now, therefore, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping and with mourning, because they heard the warning of judgment, right? God's people should repent. It doesn't make their repentance less valid because they had to be scared into it. The important thing is that they turn back to the Lord in sincerity. And God tells them how, right? Sincere repentance is to turn to God 
and therefore away from sin. Let me say that again. Sincere repentance is to turn to God and therefore away from our sin. Sincere repentance is also done with all your heart, giving everything you can in surrender to God. And sincere repentance is marked by action. We see this described as fasting and with emotion, with weeping, mourning. Not, not every act of repentance will include fasting and weeping. But if action and emotion are absent, it isn't real repentance. Right? This is where we're asking God to forgive our wrongdoings against him. And if we're truly repentant, there's a there should be sorrow over what we've done, right? And and however, if we just admit that and we're a bit sorrowful, but then we keep on doing things, that's not true repentance, right? True repentance is that turning away. We confess our sins to our heavenly father and we turn away from it and we do everything in our power to stay away from uh, that kind of sin now joel says here rend your heart and not your garments you know what one, one expression of mourning in, in, in jewish culture wasn't still is in some cases tearing of the clothes it was a way to say, I am so overcome with grief that I don't care if my clothes are ruined and I look bad. Joel knew that someone could tear their garments without tearing their heart. And he described the kind of heart repentance that really pleases God. You know, I got to bring Charles Spurgeon into this. And he, he tells the story of a woman who came seeming to be in great sorrow, saying what a great sinner she was. But Spurgeon suspected her repentance wasn't sincere. He said, well, if you are a sinner, of course, you have broken God's laws. Let's read the Ten Commandments and see which ones you have broken. They started at the first. You shall have no other gods before me. And Spurgeon asked her if she ever broke that commandment. Oh, no, she said, not that I know of. You shall not make any graven image. Did you ever break that one? Never, sir, she answered. As you might suppose, Spurgeon went through all Ten Commandments, and she could not find a single one that she had broken, and what he suspected was true. She didn't really consider herself a sinner, and she was making a show of repentance because she thought it was expected of her. So as you think about it and examine your own steps of repentance, are you doing it as a show uh, for someone to, to think differently of you and so forth? I hope not, right? That needs to be a real act of asking God's forgiveness and then turning away, taking those actions necessary to keep those things out of your life. Joel tells us also in his passage, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. You know, knowing the goodness and mercy of God, it really is another motive for true repentance. We come to him confident that he will heal and forgive and that he may relent from the judgment he announced. Now, we don't repent with the idea that God is so mean that if I don't return to him, he will destroy me. Instead, it's God is so gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness that he will spare me from what I deserve if I turn back to him. Ultimately, it's his goodness that leads us to repentance, right? Paul tells us this in Romans 2, 4. Now, he gives us this example of let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. You know, it, in addition to this 
uh, same pattern of repentance that already first presented to us back in chapter one. Joel adds the ideas relevant, right, to this bridegroom and the bride. The idea with these images is that in a time of repentance, God's people cannot carry on as usual. Usually the bridegroom belongs in his chamber and the bride belongs in her dressing room, but not now. It's time to repent. True repentance does not carry on with business as usual. Let the priest who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Leaders among God's people must especially lead in repentance. They can't come with the attitude that the people must repent. They must regard themselves as the people and the people as themselves and lead in repentance. That's another strong, strong call to those that are in ministry, those that want to preach and, and so forth. Uh, even, you know, the, it, we all have some leadership aspects in ministry, even within our families. And if we're always pointing our finger to the others saying, that, you know, you need to repent. You know, we forget about those other three fingers that are pointing back at us. Have we done the same thing? Something for you to consider, right? And then Joel says, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach. It, Joel is basically writing this prayer of repentance, right? For the priest, it's as if the priest should pray without how we can persuade God to have mercy on us. He asks him to spare, and this implies that God's people deserve judgment, but they plead for mercy. He talks, spare your people, and this, right, is remind God that they belong to him and provides another motivation for mercy. Not that God needs a reminding, but it's Really think about that, right? If you're praying to spare your people, O oh Lord, and you're part of, you know, that brings to mind you know, you're part of his people as well. And he says, do not give your heritage to reproach. It tells God of mercy unto his people, bring him glory among the nations, and that judgment might bring his name into discredit. And again, this is more about the kinds of things that, that Joel is urging the priests to think about in their prayers. Now, we know from our studies in the New Testament that, you know, the Apostle Paul assumes that suffering and affliction, far from being abnormal, really are the lot of the believer. Suffering in the form of persecution or abuse from others is to be expected when the church opposes the prevalent and corrupt structures of its society. All you have to do is take a look at what's going on around us. You know, those that are standing up against some of these crazy policies that are coming out regarding the, you know, the, the uh, anything other than, you know, when I, if you recall, I'm thinking back, I'm, kind of stumbling for words a little bit, but if you think back, right, we, the, you know, proposition, I think it was number eight here in California that was uh, regarding the, you know, sanctity of marriage between a man and a woman and how reviled the church got being taught backwards and out of step with thinking and so on and so forth. And that's how it goes. And, and, and it's escalated from that, right? Anyone that stands up and speaks against the things that the Bible says are abhorrent, you're going to get persecuted. You are going to get slammed by our current society. And, and that's what Paul is warning us about. Yeah. And, and we have to think about it in, in the reality that it is. These are wounds that we'll receive from spiritual warfare that goes on. In fact, um, you know, Paul does it. He could rejoice in suffering, Romans chapter 5. Not, not that Paul was a masochist, but he could see the results of suffering in those who were yielded to God. The endurance, 
character, hope, these are things that come out of that, right? In suffering, we receive the comfort of God. And he tells us that the reason for that is that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble, 2 Corinthians 1, 4. When we're tempted to throw in the towel and turn from God because of disaster, it may help to look again at the Lord Jesus for several reasons. First, in the cross, God bore the ultimate disaster. Who can endure the day of the Lord, says Joel, as Jerusalem was threatened with ruin? Across the centuries comes the answer. God has already endured the wrath of the day of the Lord for us. The judgment on sin, which we each deserved, he took upon himself in the person of his son so that none of us need to know the ultimate disaster, right? Which is separation from God for eternity. This should remind us that God is not some unsympathetic or unmoved supervisor of the universe, indifferent to the pain of our suffering. It should also remind us of how valuable we are to God and how committed he is to each of us. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Romans 8.32. Moreover, as we look at Jesus, we are reminded that not even the Son of God looked forward to suffering with delight or bore it only in stoic silence. Right In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed that God might spare him from the cross. On the cross, he cried out in anguish as he bore the sin of the world. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46. We need not demand more of ourselves or others as we endure suffering. When you don't know where to turn, return to the Lord. Why? because he is not some cosmic policeman or sadistic headmaster who delights in our suffering, but is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. We see these qualities of God through the pages of the Old Testament and in the book of Joel, which we're studying, but nowhere do we see them more clearly than in Jesus, the Son of God and the Word of God to us. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you have a great week coming forward for you and, and ask that uh, you, know, you think about these things that we've just talked about and studied a bit and the thoughts of repentance. Are you, uh, you know, is, is that a part of your life? And when you repent, it, is you have not only the emotion, but are you taking actions as a result of it? I hope so. At any rate, our next study will pick up here where we left off in Joel chapter 2. Till then, God bless.